Uh, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to our um, third Thursday science webinar series. Um, this is a, a science series, a webinar series that we have, uh, obviously, on the third Thursday of every month. Um, I am Sheila Heymans, your um, moderator for today. I'm the executive director of the European Marine Board. And um, today <clears throat> um, we are going to be talking, we're going to be hearing about how we can involve stakeholders in co-creation of ecosystem services research. So obviously um, this research is, is based on some of our documents, but before I go to that, I would like to just go through some housekeeping rules. Um, please make sure that your name is clearly entered um, so that uh, if, you're asked, if you ask a question so that we know who you are. It's also helpful if you put where you're from, which institute or country, um, that really helps us as well. And for that, please use the question and answer section um, to ask any questions. Um, and um, what we'll do then once we've had the talks is we will, um, I will moderate the discussion and I will um, speak your questions. I will, I will read your questions out to the, to the speakers. Um, <clears throat> if you have any technical problems, please use the chat function. Um, that's only uh, visible, visible for the host, so it's, it's uh, useful to help if anybody has any technical problems. Uh, please also be aware that this um, session is actually being recorded and being made available um, on YouTube, so um, act accordingly. Um, and you will be able to see this, uh, the, 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 this talk again on our um, website and on our YouTube channel. Um, so, without further ado, oops, I'll go to uh, telling you a little bit about the focus of the science webinar in this case. Um, so, the European Marine Board has had two documents, which is the background of, of what we're going to be discussing, discussing today. The first one is valuing marine ecosystems, uh, taking into account the value of ecosystem benefits in the blue economy. That's the first one. It's a future, future science brief that came out in April of 2019, but also valuing marine ecosystems and co-design sustainability science was one of the main chapters in Navigating the Future 5, which is a position paper that also came out in, twin, uh, in 2019. Um, you can download both of these documents from our website. So if you're interested, um, I would suggest that you go there. Um, so we are going to have two speakers, uh, uh, Professor Linwood Pendleton, who is the Executive uh, Director of the Ocean Knowledge Action Network in France. He's also the International Chair of Excellence at the European Institute for Marine Studies. He was a member of the Executive Planning Committee of the UN Decade for Ocean Science, for, of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, and he now, now serves on the Interim Decade um, Advisory Board. Um, and he is, as I said, going to be talking about how we involve stakeholders in co-creation. But first, we are going to have a talk by uh, Dr. Tara Hooper, who is a principal specialist in marine natural capital and ecosystems at Natural England. And she is going to give us a talk about structured approaches for stakeholder engagement. Um, very different from most of our science um, webinars is that we will not have any slides. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I, I will ask Tara to please put up, uh, put on her, her video and, and um, start giving her presentation. Thank you very much, Tara. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Linwood persuaded me to do this talk without slides, which I'm not used to doing. So we will see how it goes. And um, it does mean I've rehearsed more than I usually do. Um, but also that I could see something other than my slides. And it'd be nice not to be, feel like I'm talking into the vo void, which is how it usually feels when I'm giving an online talk. So I'm going to talk a bit about my experience of co-creation of natural capital and ecosystem service assessments. I'll talk about a couple of different but connected projects as examples of what we did and how before summing up the lessons that I've learned from those projects and my wider experience. And finally, giving an example of a project that I had no actual involvement with, but which I think really sums up the direction that needs to be taken. So I want to start by talking about Valmare. Uh, this was an interreg project that ran between 2012 and 2015 with case study sites in Northwest France and also in Southwest England. It was a partnership project um, between academics and stakeholders, including marine parks authorities, county councils. And the way that project was set up helped us to understand the need for and the opportunities of co-created approaches. Um, 
one of the key things we were trying to do was address the issue that ecosystem service assessments were being undertaken, but they weren't being used. Um, there was a paper in 2013 by Lorenz and others that neatly demonstrated this because it showed that only 2% of the ecosystem service valuations published in the journal Ecological Economics had any documented use associated with them. Now, whether there's evidence that this situation has changed is perhaps something we can discuss um, later on in the webinar. So what we wanted to do was to develop a process to be applied when the idea of conducting an ecosystem service assessment was first conceived to help define its aim, scopes and the methods and tools. And the purpose of doing this was in order to make sure that the outcome was meaningful and useful and also that the process was feasible. We wanted to ensure that the process was transparent, strategic and most importantly, that it involved stakeholders from the outset. And so what we came up with was the triage. And this is a structured process that broke down the components of the decision on what kind of ecosystem service assessment was needed, why and how to do it. And so we use this triage approach with our Valmer partners in both the UK's North Devon Marine Biosphere Reserve and also France's Iwas Marine Natural Park. So the triage was split into three stages. And the first part was to determine why an ecosystem service assessment was being considered and to conduct wider general scoping of its broad parameters. And the first question put to the stakeholder was quite simply, for what purpose is the assessment needed? I mean, that might seem really obvious, but having discussions to articulate clearly why the assessment is needed is fundamentally important. And often because it seems so obvious, that's why it's skipped over. And we classified the purpose of the ecosystem service assessment into three categories. There's informative use, which is things like improving or integrating knowledge, initial identification of the key issues, and just generally raising awareness. There's decisive use, incorporating things like looking at future changes, considering trade-offs and comparing different management options. And finally, technical use, which is primarily about designing those management options. And for both our case studies, the main purpose was either to design on the French side or compare in the UK side management options. And although they were less important, it's, it's noteworthy that informative uses, particularly raising awareness and improving knowledge, also featured quite strongly in both of the case studies. So to complete the first scoping stage, there were two other questions. What are the most important policy issues and what parts of the marine socio-ecological system interact with these issues? And here, the context of our case studies differ quite widely because the French partners had a very focused need around the management of kelp habitats. Whereas in North Devon, the partners were interested in a range of services and habitats and how to manage their marine area as a whole. So having completed this initial scoping, the second stage of the triage focused on potential changes to the status or value of assets and services and how much influence the stakeholders and their management actions would have on them. Again, we split this down into three questions that explored firstly, the potential of the value of the functions and services to change. If little change is expected, then there'd be little purpose in actually doing an assessment. Next, the stakeholders were asked to consider how any envisaged interventions would influence these changes. Again, if local management is unlikely to significantly affect the provision of services, then there's not really a lot of point in doing an assessment. And finally, we asked what other factors were like to affect the status or value of the ecosystem services under consideration? Because the usefulness of an assessment would also be affected if other drivers like climate change were likely to have a more significant influence on the assets and services than any local management intervention. So to use North Devon as an example, this process led to the prioritization of nursery habitat provision over services that the stakeholders initially thought were likely to be more important, including carbon sequestration and the effect of offshore wind on visual amenity. This was because going through the process showed that actually there was limited potential for the carbon value to change because of the small area affected, while the role of local stakeholders in management decisions for offshore wind was limited because those decisions were made at a national level. So having identified why the ecosystem service assessment was needed and its scope. The final stage of the triage concerned the identification of meaningful metrics, the methods and tools by which these could be measured, and then the feasibility of applying the preferred methods and tools. This step of the process also highlighted very different needs between the two groups of stakeholders. Economic indicators were more important in the French case study, but the North Devon study focused more on broad scale and more qualitative assessments partly due to resource limitation, but also because monetary values just weren't really a priority for them. So the similarities and differences between the English and French case studies was obviously a key outcome of the process, but there was broader learning about the whole engagement process. Um, developing the triage was an iterative process that evolved between the two case studies and applied different techniques, including surveys versus deliberative processes and quantitative scoring versus categorical rating. 
overall though as a structured process it did prove to be a very useful framework for structuring the discussion and focusing the subsequent assessment i think the usefulness of the triage and co-creation approach more generally is perhaps highlighted by the way in which the North Devon Biosphere Reserve continues to put itself at the forefront of ecosystem service assessment in the UK, even after Valmet, well, years after Valmet, although lately the term ecosystem service assessment has been replaced by natural capital approach, which I'll use that term more probably going forward. So North Devon successfully bid to be one of two case studies for the Marine Pioneer Programme. And just to give some context on what that programme is, in 2018, the UK government published its 25-year environment plan to outline its ambition for leaving the marine environment in a better state than we found it. The plan included a commitment to use the natural capital approach in decision making, although particularly for the marine environment, what that actually meant wasn't well defined, well wasn't really defined at all. So the Pioneer Programme was set up with the broad objectives to explore how we should go about actually applying a natural capital approach to decision making and hence improving our understanding of what works in practice as well as trying to use the process to build in innovation around integrated approaches to planning and delivery and also developing innovative funding opportunities. So the Marine Pioneer Project in North Devon tested a number of tools and methods. So it included things like asset and risk registers, you know, that were sort of coming to expect to be part of natural capital assessment, but stakeholder engagement and co-creation was once again a fundamental concept within the project. And we started an even earlier stage than just talking about natural capital assessment. Instead, we work with the local stakeholders to articulate their vision for North Devon's marine area, exploring what assets they valued and wanted to maintain, the challenges that were having a negative effect, and the positive trends and opportunities that could be built on to maintain and improve the marine area. And this created a real shared understanding of where collectively they were and where they wanted to go. Then we convened a further workshop to focus in on the scope for using natural capital approaches to support delivery of that marine vision that they had just co-created. We took a slightly different approach to the triage and started by asking what were the main components of the decision-making process. This was in recognition of the very structured governance systems and legislation that controlled who could make decisions and enact change and about what. So having understood the decision context, the next question was how could natural appro capital approaches be integrated into particular decision pathways? And this kind of broad scoping was followed by a reality check thinking about the key barriers, how to maximize benefits and where there were quick wins. For example, this led us to choosing strategic planning and sustainability appraisal as the areas in which to focus as the regulatory framework for environmental impact assessment was too rigid in its current form to support the incorporation of natural capital assessment. And then the final component of this discussion was understanding what the practitioners needed so the natural capital assessment could become part of their day-to-day -day work and wouldn't just stop when the Pioneer Project concluded. So like Valmer, the Marine Pioneer helped us to move on with how to do marine natural capital assessment, including leading to the first marine natural capital plan developed in the UK, increasing the engagement of the local authority with their marine area, um, but also in using the marine as the context to join up and even lead natural capital approaches applicable to both land and sea, instead of marine following on behind at some considerable time lag, which is how it often happens. So I guess I can say that projects I've worked on have made some incremental progress in getting natural capital assessment into marine decision making in practice but perhaps more important are the lessons I've learned having attempted to do so using participatory approaches and co-creation. So my first lesson is to have properly interdisciplinary teams and to learn from other academic fields. Natural capital assessment tends to be driven by either ecologists or economists and there's a wealth of social science theory and practice that's really important for properly engaging with and capturing the perspectives of the stakeholders. For example, we hadn't heard of structured decision making as a formal method before we started developing the triage and we could have learned a lot from it. Secondly, monetary values often aren't a key driver for natural capital assessment. Stakeholders may have a very specific questions for which they want a monetary value. In Valmer, for example, we did a travel cost assessment for recreation in Pool Harbour, but often they want an assessment mostly to give them a broader picture of issues and trade-offs. Related to that, stakeholders often don't like the monetary values when they get them, as they're often perceived as being too low. And we found this with French stakeholders in Valmet, for example. Also, stakeholders often don't want an answer. I mean, you know, some economists might argue that we should all be trying to monetize everything and undertake cost benefit analysis because that will give us an objective, correct answer. But this isn't how most of the stakeholders I engage with see it. In North Devon, for example, the planning team in the local authority wanted to present the relative consequences of different options and alternatives recognising that decisions are always political 
And the person making the decision has to make up their own mind based on the values and commitments that drove their appointment. Similarly, stakeholders don't always want new tools. We want to give them models, but sometimes they just want some outline guidance. Unfortunately, there can be a mismatch here between funders looking for shiny innovation and the more mundane fundamental needs. Um, also, I have found that local stakeholders are more engaged than national ones. Um, I mean, that's quite a bold statement based on a narrow sample, as I'm only talking in the UK context. But inertia seems much higher in national government, no matter how much they use the buzzwords. At the local level, people seem to have a clear idea of what they want and need to do, and are much more motivated to try something different. Um, it was interesting within the Pioneer that despite having commissioned the programme, national government never really engaged particularly strongly, and I have met similar barriers since. The attitude of people within the statutory environmental agencies, however, definitely evolved during the process. Primarily environmental scientists, some were a little sceptical of the aspects of the programme that concerned engagement and co-creation. There's a persistent view that if we can just provide better environmental evidence and better decisions on environmental management be made. Um, going through the process of, of the pioneer really changed hearts and minds on that one. And so to, clue, to, to conclude, I want to finish back where I started on ecosystem service assessment evaluation and whether in the years since the Lorenzo Tell paper, they are any more likely to actually get used. And there's an excellent table in a report that came from the World Bank Waves program in 2017 that I show every time I talk about natural capital because it so nicely illustrates why we're moving forward so slowly. If you bear with me, I will quickly share my screen for this. Is that now on screen? Perfect. And so I think the problem remains that in the UK at least, oh, sorry. Can you still see the PowerPoint slides? Um, we tend to focus on the left-hand side of this table. Um, you, we, we've got technical experts working very hard on getting the data right, getting the methods right. Um, but what we really need to do is move more towards the right-hand side. Um, and this is where co-creation starts to move us towards. Because if the natural capital approach is actually going to support significant change and hope and we hope better environmental outcomes and that more co-created position is where we need to start to be. So to end on a more positive note, I do have one recent and concrete example of a marine management decision being based on the natural capital approach. Um, there's been a significant loss of kelp from nearshore areas in the UK <clears throat> excuse me, including in Sussex, which is sort of on the, the, the middle part of the south coast. And so a couple of years ago, the Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, who are responsible for primarily fisheries management um, out to the six, mile, six nautical mile limit, and they needed to review their inshore trawling bylaw. And they decided to use a natural capital approach to justify why they needed to extend the bylaw from a seasonal closure in a small area to a permanent closure across a large area. And they did all the things we've come to expect of a natural capital approach, asset and risk registers, valuation studies, and so on. But why it worked so well was they, they started from the need. The stakeholders had considered what they were trying to change and what were the mechanisms available to do so. They then commissioned the experts, the economists, to do the assessment when they had reached that stage. It wasn't driven by the experts trying to apply their tools and methods. But the real success was that they took a partnership approach involving NGOs, the local council, as well as the regulators, and had significant public engagement to the extent that two and a half thousand people submitted responses to the bylaw consultation rather than the usual handful of angry fishermen. As well as the bylaw being passed, this process has also led to something previously unheard of. In England, the responsibility of the local authority ends at the low water mark, but two local councils in Sussex are now exploring how they can lease subtidal seabed areas in order to further support the process of kelp restoration. So there is a blueprint for successful place-based co-created marine management decisions using natural capital assessment, providing we start in the right place and we involve the right people. So I'll paste some links into the chat so you can read more about the projects I've been talking about. But right now I'll hand over to Linwood Pendleton, who was the inspiration behind the triage process, and then he can talk a bit more about the wider issues in the co-creation of marine science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. And um, I'm not, I don't see any questions, so I think I'll go straight to Linwood and then we can go the, do the discussion um, afterwards. Great. Thanks, Sheila. And, and thank you, Tara. 
I could spend all of my 15 minutes talking about things that you mentioned, and, and there were so many good points there. Also, before I get started, I just want to um, take a few minutes to uh, thank the people who got inside the, my Google Doc of the remarks that I'm planning to, to give in a few minutes and already started making comments. And I'd really like to hear from you whether you think that it, advanced sharing of remarks um, is helpful and, and is a, a different and perhaps a good way of doing these talks. And if you have any thoughts about us not using slides and just talking to you, let us know about that too. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more broadly about the co-creation of science and, and really, while talking broadly, get deeper into what it means because there's a lot of misunderstandings out there, I think. And, and really, I'm talking about the co-creation of science specifically with the intent of generating new, more useful knowledge for sustainable development. And you, you hear about the co-creation of science, the co-design of science, you often hear about the co-creation of knowledge. And I, I wanna make the point that science and knowledge are not the same thing. And when I talk about science, I'm usually thinking of the definition that means one of two things. So science is sometimes considered to be a body of knowledge or science is the process that we use to acquire that knowledge. And really um, in this, my short time here, I, I'm really thinking of this process of science and, and how do we co-create uh, that process with people who are not scientists and people who are making decisions generally. And when I think of that, you know, science is a way of knowing, this is a term that we use all the time now, but it's a way of knowing that follows basic principles and rules in order to increase our understanding of the natural world. And that's the goal here. And these principles and approaches may differ um, by discipline. It can differ um, by topic sometimes, but usually the principles are well-known they're evidence-based, they're transparent, repeatable, and testable, and that's the key. We're all working from the same set of rules when we do science together. The process of science is one that we use to establish facts and to improve our understanding of how the natural world works, and thus to add to our base of knowledge. And, and when I say that base of knowledge, that really is that those things that we believe to be true or those things that we think we know. Um, I make this distinction because I think there are many ways of knowing, and, and we hear this quite frequently. And science is just one of these ways of knowing. But I also want to point out that not all ways of knowing yield knowledge that's accurate, reproducible, or improves our understanding of the natural world. And this, I think, is going to be important, particularly as we move forward in the decade of science, to make sure that when we think about different ways of knowing, we, we test those ways of knowing, and we make sure that they're accurate and reproducible and increase our understanding. We know that many types of extra scientific knowledge are indeed helpful and contain a lot of information they are formative, but certainly that's not true of all non-scientifically derived knowledge. So I, I wanna avoid that broader debate um, and, and really focus on science and note that it's this co-creation of science that lies at the heart of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And I also wanna be clear because Sheila mentioned uh, my role in the decade, I'm not speaking for the ocean decade in any way, but I, I am reflecting on the work I've done um, with the executive planning group and trying to articulate my comments, what I personally feel I think we need to do if we're really gonna create new science that we need for the ocean we want. Now, part of what drives my thinking about this is a realization that the, the science to policy paradigm it's just not enough. And if you're as old as I am, you probably remember when science to policy really started to gain traction. For me, I feel like it was back in the 1990s. And in my experience, the movement came largely from scientists that wanted public policy to be better informed by facts and research. And in particular, we wanted the science to be informed by our research. We wanted our research to matter. And the way we were told and taught to do this was to be more effective at communicating our science. And since then, um, even in the last few years, there have been a, a whole series of articles about how to do this in, in nature, for instance. And many of these articles uh, expressly say that their intent is to guide scientists on the best ways to do things like target your audience, repackage your work, pick your moment, and then pounce on those opportunities when your science will have the most 
influence on policy. And I think as we heard Tara um, say really clearly that most policy is not made um, by the science itself. It, it's informed by science and science certainly has a role to play. But this idea that science is supposed to influence policy uh, can have some per perverse uh, effects. Um, I think the, the underlying egocentricity of this science to policy approach, even if it's well intentioned, is, is apparent in, in some other columns that have also appeared in Nature. And if you go to the Google Doc, I link to those columns. But these columns really urge scientists to find new ways of using their science to shape policy, to guide policy, or influence policy. And unfortunately, I think that um, in many cases, thinking about this policy at the end of the pipe of science really has helped um, lead to some outcomes that weren't intended and has not always helped to improve the relevance of science for the decisions that policymakers and stakeholders and decision makers in general need. And at worst, the science to policy approach can lead to situations in which decisions may be unduly influenced by those scientists who best advocate for their science or their species or those places where they work and not necessarily the science that's most appropriate, balanced or provides the most holistic scientific assessment of the situation at hand. So as a, an alternative to the science to policy process where we've kind of migrated is to this co-creation of science. And the idea behind co-creating science for sustainable development is really to move these decision makers from the end of the line, um, work package six is where we often find them, to the beginning of the scientific process so that they can work with, scientists can work with decision makers early on, whether those decision makers are consumers or fishers or managers or beachgoers, to understand the need for evidence and scientific understanding, particularly when we think about weighing the trade-offs that are involved in making decisions. And this really is, I think, a key part of the way we've talked about the co-design of science in the decade of ocean science, is how can we co-design science so that people can really weigh the potential outcomes of different scientific paths? And, and how can we monitor what's working and what's not working? And co-creating science in this way is really about working together to figure out how to employ scientific methods so we collect and analyze evidence and data, so we understand what the results are going to mean and we talk in advance about how are we going to analyze the results and, and what does that mean to us? When do we reject the null hypothesis and when don't we? Um, and, and to deal with the findings as we have them, including scientific uncertainty that always accompanies the scientific process. And if you start talking about that at the beginning, it really is much more informative in the policy process. This is of course a highly participatory process. It's often discussed in the context of open science or mission oriented research. And I think as Tara pointed out, we need to recognize here that not everyone uh, needs to or wants to participate in the co-creation of science. Sometimes that's just not um, where the science is most effective. So we really have to be smart and careful about who we include in the co-creation of science and how. The, the co-creation of science is not, I think as sometimes people assume, an opportunity for stakeholders to get in and bias or skew the science. And it's not a movement to replace basic science. And this came up last summer during um, one of the EC's International Ocean Governance IOG forum workshops on ocean knowledge systems. And I brought up the idea of co-creation of science and one of the participants was really strongly opposed to the idea of co-creating science. And I, I think what I was hearing was really this fear that what I was talking about was a, a new way of, of guiding the scientific process to get to an outcome that non-scientists were looking for. And, and that really isn't what we're talking about at all when we talk about the co-creation of science. What we're talking about really is just trying to make sure that we give stakeholders the science they need and the resolution they need at the frequency they need to move away from a world in which scientists um, usually create science and then we leave the decision makers to simply make do with the best available science and try to use what we've done 
to make their decisions. And a lot of times the science we create is really difficult to use no matter how well you communicate it. So we wanna get away from that. If we're gonna do this though, we have to be scientific about the science of co-creating science. And of course, for the co-creation of science to be effective, we have to be clear-eyed and scientific about understanding what works in, in the co-creation of science and what doesn't work. And that is, you know, there are many ways of involving stakeholders and decision makers in the co-creation of science, and they don't all work, or some work in some cultures, but not in others. Some kinds of approaches to co-creating science work for certain subjects, but not others, and certain political regimes, but not others. Um, and there are just many, many factors that can influence uh, what approaches to the co-creation of science really work and are appropriate for the decisions that need to be made. So we have to um, realize that there are many lessons that have already been learned that we can draw from. And there are many lessons that are going to be learned in the next decade. And we have to do a really good job of keeping track of how we do the co-creation of science and making sure that we note, we document and we communicate what works and what hasn't worked for us. Now, um, there is a lot of information out there uh, about what works and what doesn't work in the co-creation of science, but it is rather surprising that this science of the co-creation of science is often ignored by some of those most eager to pursue, pursue more participatory approaches in the ocean realm. Some ocean scientists are, are simply unaware that social scientists and sustainability scientists have been studying the co-creation process itself for much of the last two decades. Um, but another part of the problem is, is that when we have done co-creation well, it's often been for things that weren't exactly science. So technical innovation, we co-create all the time with end users. Um, there are other non-ocean applications where we bring in end users, but we need to make sure that we understand that uh, user experience co-creation is not the same as scientific co-creation. Now, another problem is that marine scientists that do uh, use co-creation methods simply often fail to write about those methods, or they do so only descriptively, or they do so in kind of a positive, sometimes a fluffy way to uh, please funders. And, and we really have to make sure that if we're gonna learn from this, we write about what works and what doesn't. And then finally, the, the scientists that have written about um, the co-creation of science often publish these papers in places that uh, just aren't being seen. And for instance, um, I looked in the Ocean Best Practices database earlier this week just to see how many papers on the best practices of co-creating science I could find. And I couldn't find any, and I talked to people and um, the Earth Systems Governance Task, Oceans Task Force of Future Earth. And they didn't even know that this database was a, a place that you could put these papers. So non-social scientists um, working in ocean science could see them. Now we really need to do a, a much better job of making sure we communicate the knowledge about co-creating science as we obtain it. So uh, addressing this lack of awareness uh, and communication about what the co-creation of ocean science and coastal science is and how to do it now is at, at the heart of many um, decade processes. It's also a direct part of um, some of these decade endorsed programs like the GEOS and ICES and Pisces have SmartNet, which is also very much focused on improving knowledge transfer about the co-creation science. And of course, um, it is at the heart of what we're trying to do in the Ocean Knowledge Action Network. And specifically, the Ocean Knowledge Action Network that I am now um, leading, or I'm leading the International Project Office that supports this network, is really trying to increase awareness and sharing knowledge about the application and implementation of methods for co-creating science and really connecting people that want to participate in these participatory processes. And by people, I mean scientists with stakeholders and then the social scientists who can really help make those connections um, and beyond. And so we're doing this by creating a network of networks and that network is going to try to bring together some key large science networks like the SCORE and the World, Concert, uh, World Climate Research Program together with decade programs and stakeholders, and in doing so, try to find new ways of sharing this knowledge 
about how co-creation is working for them. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you haven't gone to the Google Doc where these remarks are and you want to comment, that uh, link is still open. And I'm very interested in, in hearing more about what you think. Get in there and, and comment and comment on each other's comments. And let's see if we can take this conversation forward. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much, Linwood. Um, so I see we have uh, two questions there from Cedric. Um, uh, I just want to see if I understand it correctly. So Cedric uh, Bacher asks, uh, sorry, <laughs> regarding co-construction of science, is there any, anything specific to the marine realm? Um, and then following on from that, uh, are there links between social and natural scientists, I guess, in the marine realm? And, and I will say that, well, maybe you guys want to answer that question, and then I'll go with mine, and hopefully we'll have some more. Um, Linwood, did you want to try and answer that? I mean, other than what Tara was obviously describing, I'm not sure what he specifically means by marine. Well, so if you mean, is there documented evidence about how the co-creation of science works in the marine realm? There is, um, and it's been written up by a, a number of people. But as I mentioned, it's often published in, in journals that you would never consider. And unless you really looked hard, you, you might not find them. Um, and, and so part of what I'll be doing in the Ocean Knowledge Action Network is trying to bring those resources together so we can share those. But you know, much more of the um, science behind co-creating science and participatory approaches has occurred outside of the ocean realm in conservation science on land. Uh, a lot of it has occurred in Africa because when elephants run right through your village, you've got to co-create science to figure out how to manage them. Um, and, and so I'm also spending a lot of time really looking outside of the ocean world to figure out who we need to bring in. And we'll be sponsoring a half day um, innovative session at Ocean Sciences meeting to do just that. Um. Tara, did you want to add something to that? Um, I suppose maybe just on the, the link between social and natural scientists, um, because I think that is definitely, you know, obviously the idea of individuals being more interdisciplinary as well as programmes and projects being more interdisciplinary, I think is evolving. And, you know, there are things like sort of, I think more interdisciplinary and joint PhDs sort of things of that mm -hmm. nature. So I think gradually this process of people within their own individual development as well as within projects looking more widely I think was kind of helping yeah. us moving us in that direction. Yeah you know and to that point I, I would mention that many of our most active early career ocean professionals have been trained interdisciplinarily or transdisciplinarily and they're doing this all the time. This is just a natural way of thinking and when I've interviewed all these candidates for our new science officer you just really see that, you know, they're thinking about these links between social science and marine science and how do you co-create science from the very start. It's just a more natural way of working, I think, for our young ECOPs. And that's why um, having ECOPs participating in, in all of our research is an important way of improving how we co-create science. Sheila? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess you've sort of answered my question already. <laughs> my question was really going to be, what is the best example that you've seen? And, and I, I agree that, that some of the, you know, conservancies, for instance, that they have in Namibia is a very good example of how they're co-creating the conservation and science of, of you know, um, elephants or whatever in, in, in the area. Um, in the marine realm, do you can you can you give us one really concrete good example? Um. <laughs> Shall I start with that one? Because my yeah. short answer is probably not really. So the the example I gave in my talk of Sussex um, is one that you know I'm kind of quite excited by. I mean, arguably, did they co-create the science or did they sort of co-create what they needed and sort of I suppose commission? standard science if you see what I mean but I um, mean you know that was a direction that looked really good within the the UK marine policy sphere um, and I mean you know I've not worked outside the UK for a while now but certainly again those kind of more immediate needs particularly around things like you know marine protected areas and so on does tend to lead to more co-creation by necessity um, rather than by design I suppose. 
Leonard, did you want yeah. to think? I, I'm thinking with the triage approach that we took, to me, that was informative because we were at least able to give people the information they wanted. And the, I feel like thinking about using ecosystem services and that kind of science has really taken hold in both the UK and in the Brittany region where I've been working because of that. Whereas, you know, when I've done these ecosystem service assessments before without using the triage approach, it has really elicited strong backlash, um, particularly when you give people an answer that was different than what they were hoping. And I, I you know, I've been told that it's junk science uh, because people weren't involved in doing the science. So I do think that that positive result um, was a, a very good example of doing it. Thanks, because I, I guess I've, I've, I've had some experiences in trying to involve fishermen in creating ecosystem models. So that's kind of my background. And, and I certainly have had a very good and a very bad experience in that. And, and the very bad experience was when I was much younger and worked in Canada. And, and I think looking back on it, it was because we were trying to give them the answers to, for them to pick. Whereas a good example was in the work that we did in the Irish Sea with fishermen there, where, first of all, they wanted the work done in the first place, and they co-created the models with us, and, and we then took the models back to them, and they, they understood perfectly the process, significantly better. And so I guess my, my question was coming from, a, you know, what, from my personal experience, I think the best lesson I learned there was you really need very close collaboration with stakeholders from the beginning. And it kind of has to come from them. I don't, I, I just don't think it can come from the science. It has to come from the other side. Otherwise it never work. That's, that's my experience. And, and, and there, I think there are a number of examples. I can't point to any specific ones now, but um, in participatory fisheries research in the Gulf of Maine, where I was on the Gulf of Maine Research Institute Science Board, they had many examples of how fishermen were driving the research around tuna and lobsters. And once they had that information, they really started acting on adaptation and incorporating climate change in their thinking because they had done the research themselves with, you know, with hand in hand with the scientists, but they were collecting the data and they were taking the scientists out. And so um, I, I think we're gonna see this coming up through the smart net from ICES and Pisces because they're so well informed about fisheries and participatory science. That certainly is, is the, the one place in the ocean realm where we have, I think, the most knowledge and examples of how to do this. And I, I think also um, from what I remember, uh, for instance, the, the way they model uh, stock assessment of sable fish in the Pacific, for instance, is specifically driven by the fishermen. They're basically the, the ones that are doing it themselves because the you know, um, American and Canadian government isn't actually doing that stuff. So I think a lot more to be learned from, from what's happening in fishery. There's also, as I said, there, have, there are some bad examples there too. Yeah. Um, we have a question again from Cedric um, uh, saying, do NGOs have a key role in co-creating science? So WWF, IUCN, um, it, you know, do, do, do you see a good, a, a good role for them in that situation? Oh yes, again, short answer for me would be yes. Um, again, it's the you know the, the right people in the right place for the right reasons. So you know, there's there's no reason why it shouldn't come from NGOs any more or less than any other stakeholders or indeed scientists, because of course NGOs often span that um that realm between the two, don't they? But I don't have any specific examples of co-creation beyond I suppose obviously WWF were a key partner in the Marine Pioneer, so they were very involved in all the processes that were going on there. No, and, and not only do they have a role, but I think it's really important to include them because it's very easy for NGOs to try to use science in a, a confirmational way. But if you're involved in the co-creation of science from the beginning with stakeholders who may be on the other side of the fence, then you all have to agree that we're following a process and we're going to use the evidence that comes out of this process to inform decisions. Whereas if, if you wait till the end, 
Um, there was a great paper about marine protected areas effectiveness called uh, your MPA evidence or mine. And you know, it was really talking about how with 3000 plus MPAs, you can find the 300 that will confirm your priors about effectiveness or not. And, and so you, you can't do that when you co-create science together from the beginning. And I think that it creates a completely different kind of relationship with the evidence as well as between the people who were doing the science. Um, uh, I, there's a question from Isabel, but I was going to just follow on from that um, to say that I was also part of another study in uh, Scotland where uh, it was about placing marine protected areas. Um, well, no, I lie. It was about putting um, windmills in, in a specific area on the, on the, um, in, in Scotland. And, and they, we had a participatory, participatory approach where we actually had a, a GIS map with some of the stakeholders, so fishermen, you know, boaters, um, and, and the, the guys who wanted to place the, 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 the windmills there. And we were all in the same room and having to say, okay, this is the best place for me, but I'm also aware that this is, you know, there's a suboptimal place for me here, but it, it's completely impossible for you to go there. And so it was really interesting to see the stakeholders that were coming from very different, you know, perspectives, give and take in that sense, where it's, okay, this is my best place, but it's it's also the only place that works for you. So, so okay, I can get a little bit less if I go to a, a suboptimal place, but this way we're all happy. Um, and so I think if you have more than one type of stakeholder in the room, you get a much more nuanced sort of approach in that sense. Um, and, if you, and if you bring them in from the beginning, you can build a level of trust because you can do these mapping exercises where if people dispute the data upon which the maps are based, nothing comes of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so if everyone is sort of on board with how the data are being collected and has some level of trust, uh, it's just a different conversation. Yeah, and that was definitely the case in that uh, study. Okay, so the, the next question is from Isabel Sosa Pinto. Um, and that's actually a question that I also had. What is the right level of stakeholders to engage from the start of a science uh, planning for a project? I'm not sure there is a single answer to that question. Um, partly because by, I suppose by right level, do you mean sort of like government or local? Yeah, or I think. I think how based many? On, yeah, I think based on your your experience and 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 my gut feel for it, whether you know it's better to to really and try and get the local stakeholders involved, or you know whether it's better to go with the national, or whether you should have both, knowing that you might only get engagement from half. Depends. I suppose on again, the... it, sorry. No, go ahead, Tara. I was going to say it depends on your context and the question that you're trying to answer but um i definitely lean towards bottom up rather than top down approaches so i have a tendency i think to go more to the local level than to start at the national and i think it's on the decision to be informed right so if you're talking about international trade policy then you need to be working with trade representatives because they're going to have to take it to the table um, if you're talking about which fish to purchase at the supermarket, then you need to be talking about consumers. And so we really need to think that the, the choices and decisions to be made for a sustainable future involve all sorts of different levels of, of um, stakeholders. And they all, I think, uh, may have the ability to use science. We just have to figure out where science is really going to inform a decision or not because in many cases, as Tara mentioned, it is political or cultural or budgetary, in which case the science won't be that helpful. Um, and then we have a question from Victor uh, Kodera Penin, who asks, how do aspects uh, such as transparency, power analysis, precautionary approach or management of uncertainty fit into this approach? Um, I don't know if you want to try and go for, for it, Tara. Okay, I mean, <laughs> particularly, I mean, the ones I'm probably most, I guess, you know, transparency, uncertainty, all that, it, it's fundamental. And that, again, comes down to the point Lynn would just made about if you collect some evidence over here and then sort of present it to people, that leaves you much more open to kind of the, those 
conflict and there's well you know where did this evidence come from who created it why and so it yeah it's fundamental and i mean the, the whole power dynamics is also really interesting you know who who has the power what can they do with it um i mean that's an area that i'm not personally particularly familiar with but it's certainly something that we were looking at wider parts of the marine pioneers you know who are those people that really have the influence in how this evidence is used um, and where it ends up so I would say yes um, definitely they fit in but um, personally I haven't got that much experience of exactly how each one of those would be part of the wait, process. Oh wait so Britt you took it away too soon um, can you bring it back? <laughs> I'll try uh, to remember what I was think, there. I, I think if you go I don't know if you can see the answered question. Oh, answered, yes. Okay, so, you know, of, of all the things that Victor mentions, I think the, the one thing that is unambiguously um, beneficial is transparency. So I think without that, it, it won't work. But um, while power analysis is important, what the right balance of power within that relationship is going to vary, and it's going to, be, it's going to vary culturally. Um, so we, we really have to take that into account because different cultures work differently. And there are places where you really need to get one strong leader that will then tell um, their followers what to do. Uh, sometimes we've seen in, in the US, it's when you have a scientist who's become a policymaker that they are able to really incorporate science and work in the co-creation of science because they have a different level of credibility. I think the precautionary approach, once again, that's really value laden about whether it's it's a positive or a, a negative part of the co-creation of science. And it's really, what do you do with the science? So I wouldn't say that's part and parcel of co-creation of science. And uncertainty is important, but it's, it's also important to understand that sometimes the science provides an answer for which uncertainty is not that important because there's such a, a big signal and you don't want to confuse people by getting too deep into uncertainty, unless it's important to understanding the evidence you have at hand. And you know, just as an example with MPAs, a lot of times when you, you look at all of the data, people agree on 90% of what is going to be decided and it's 10% where you need a high level of certainty. And you really don't need a high level of certainty in those other areas because everyone is in agreement. So you, you, we just really have to be smart about how we deal with uncertainty. And actually that, that um, leads me to a question that Britt has asked in, in the chat, um, which, which is how do you think uh, the awareness and attitudes uh, for the need for co-creation has changed since the COVID pandemic? And specifically the, the sort of uncertainty and the communication of science uncertainties um, that, at least in Belgium, you know, there was there was not so much talk about uncertainties from from the virologists, but there was a lot of talk about uncertainties from the people who were anti-vaxxers, for instance. So, how how do you think has that changed the possibility to create science? Well, I, I think it's an empirical question that should be answered with a survey. <laughs> but you know, beyond that, I think. For me, the most important thing, the most important way that an understanding of the co-creation of science may have changed is that science isn't the right answer. It's a way of knowing and it evolves as we get more information. And so I think it has just given us a better appreciation of what is the role of science. And this goes back to something Tara said, which is we tend to think that science is going to give you the answer. And it's not, it's going to give you a better understanding of a very complicated and messy natural world. Um, and, and so COVID really has driven that home. And I think we've seen that just like with climate change, if you can find these solutions that have a positive benefit to cost ratio, not economically, but just in terms of whatever, under a variety of scenarios, um, you take that choice. And I think that's the same with sustainable development. Look at the science and ask, well, if we're wrong or if we learn something new, how much would our ch choices have changed? Thank you. Uh, Tara, did you want to uh, add something to that? Not particularly. As, to be honest, it's a really good question. It's not one that I'd thought about particularly, but I think it also comes down to where people now, you know, the point you were making about sort of, you know, anti-vaccinary, so where people get their information from 
and so you know the need for good science and science and transparency and you know it just reinforces those sort of fundamental principles thanks um and then just one final question because i think we're nearly out of time i don't know Lenwe, did you want to say some end words or something or or can i just go with my final question well i just want to say that if if you go into the the google doc and you really want to make um, more or substantial comments or you'd like to edit it and maybe turn this into a collaborative paper or a blog or something like that, just let me know. Uh, it's really there for all of us. I appreciate your comments thus far. Um, I'm very open about what we might do with that. Thanks, thanks. So um, there was one other question, which I think you've sort of answered, but Paula, uh, one of the science officers asked about training. Um, I think you both mentioned that young scientists tend to have the right training um, to be able to do co-creation more, but is there more that we can do? How can we, how can we make sure that when we train our marine scientists, that we we train them in the, in the right way to be open to co-creation? Um, I think potentially it's actually more possibly about training the decision makers. So it's not. <laughs> I think there's training to be done on both sides, so that the the scientists have the capacity to look at things in a transdisciplinary way, but also that. The decision makers have more capacity to actually kind of use that sort of evidence and work with people differently. Yeah. So, and to, to answer Julia's question, um, thinking specifically about data, data is a, a language and a currency for a whole generation of people that we need to get more involved in ocean science. And we need to make sure that when we have data online, like the blue cloud or the ocean data platform or other things like that. It's not just a, a passive resource that sits there that people download. Data can connect people that haven't been connected before because they're probably using the same data for similar purposes. And that really has always been my vision about ocean data as a, a catalyst to bring people together. And I think we need to do better at um, really linking people through that data. Thank you. Um, so, so the question that Julia was asking was really about uh, what role do you envision web-based platforms like ocean, uh, open science infrastructures like Blue Cloud play in the co-creation co uh, process you know, through digital twins and they'll be useful for supporting the process. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so that thank you for answering that because I hadn't seen that question. Sorry. It's, and, and, uh, and let me say, I think I think the biggest challenge going forward in this decade of ocean science is the proliferation of people who are now doing this work and the number of networks and the numbers of communities to practice. And you're already seeing all of the emails you get and the virtual dialogues, et cetera, et cetera, and, and really navigating through that information so that you can pull the signal out of the noise is important. And we're gonna do that through different kinds of digital platforms. And so some people are gonna to come together around um, data platforms. Some people are going to come around together through the Ocean Knowledge Action Network. Some people are going to come together through in-person meetings. And we just have to really be smart about this because otherwise we're going to drown in all of our good work and it's not gonna be effective. Thank you. Um, so uh, with, I don't know if there's any other questions, but I was, I'm just going to put oh, one more from Natalia Martin Palenzuela. Uh, can you make uh, the Google document available to more people uh, that's not attending the seminar? I don't know. If, maybe Julia, the best thing to, uh, sorry, Natalia, the best thing to do is to email, um, I don't know if you want to give your email or maybe to email to us, and we can um, we can put the, put you in contact with um, with um, Linwood, and he can give you the link. That's probably the best way to do it. Um, so uh, yeah, so just send the, the email uh, an email to info at Marine Board. Um, so thank you very much. Um, with that, I would like to thank our speakers, um, and I want to just uh, let you know that our next third Thursday uh, science webinar will be uh, obviously next uh, next 
Thursday, I'm sorry, Thursday, the 21st of October. Um, and we will be talking about the science that's behind our delving deeper um, document on critical challenges for the 21st century deep sea research. Um, and the presentation will be uh, given by Professor Alex Rogers. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing you there um, on the uh, 21st of October. And um, I, again, just want to uh, thank uh, Linwood and Tara for uh, quite an interesting discussion. And <laughs> thank you, Linwood, for, for trying a different, a different way of doing these things without, uh, without PowerPoints. It was much harder for me to speak, though. That I have to say that for me was the, the worst part was that I can't, I can't type as fast as what Tara is speaking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> slides to, to kind of, you know, prompt what, what was said. It's a little bit hard for me to, to tweet as much as I usually do. In general, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.